Welcome back to the book club. I'm Michael Knowles, and today we will be discussing the very beginning of wisdom, the book of Genesis. We're going to have to try to figure out how to get through that in 25 minutes. Luckily, we will be joined by His Excellency Bishop Robert Barron, who has a little more expertise on this than I do. Before we get to all of that, first, I've got to thank our friends over at Thinker. In our fast-paced world, it is very difficult to make reading a priority. We all say we want to read more, and then we never end up doing it, right? Thinker.org allows you to summarize the key ideas from new and noteworthy nonfiction, which gives you access to an entire library of great books in bite-sized form. You can read or listen to hundreds of titles in a matter of minutes. We're talking about American classics like Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, or more modern classics like Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. If you want to challenge your preconceptions and expand your horizons, and most importantly, sound smart at cocktail parties, you've got to go to thinker.org. That is T-H-I-N-K-R, no E, nobody has time for that, thinker.org to start your free trial and put your mind in motion. Bishop Barron, if we were having this discussion 20 years ago, there would be no reason to have to summarize the book of Genesis. People would be familiar with it, and yet now, biblical literacy may be at an all-time low. Read politician speeches in the 19th century. They're assuming the Bible at every turn. Not anymore. I found that, I mean, over my years teaching, even in Catholic institutions, talking to younger people, you make a, a reference to the book of Job, and you realize, over their head, they would never heard the book of Job. <laughs> right. So that's something we're up against uh, religiously, but also culturally, that we've lost touch with this most important book in the shaping of Western culture. As a millennial, I have been informed by highly polemical people on the internet that the <laughs> book of Genesis is really not worth very much. It was written by a bunch of illiterate goat herders. How it was written by illiterate people, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> yeah. But it would seem to me that I've never read a book more profound and full of wisdom. How was it written by all those long time ago people? Well, of course, it's consummate nonsense to say the Bible is <laughs> written by, you know, uh, ignorant shepherds and so on. Like the first books we have in the Pentateuch are probably written around the year 500 BC, most likely after the Babylonian exile. And then when the Israelites returned, uh, that's probably when those books were actually written down. Now they're based on much older, probably oral, some written sources that we probably lost, but in the form we have them, they were written at that time. They clearly came out of a very richly intellectual culture. As the Jewish culture evolved and into the very sophisticated you know, Talmudic commentaries and all that. That's the thought world out of which the Bible is coming. That, you know, these oh, poor pre-scientific, you know, um, uh, morons. They didn't even have Instagram. Yeah. Did you know that? They... <laughs> Neither did Aristotle. Last time I checked, he was pretty smart, you know. <laughs> no, that's such a terrible and stupid prejudice of, like, the, the new atheists and all that. I also wonder if, if we're told, like those new atheists tell us, uh, Richard Dawkins and uh, Christopher Hitchens and those guys, if they tell us that these books are silly, frivolous, they should be disregarded, they're ignorant— those books are the basis of our whole civilization. So what does that say about us? How didn't the Bible influence Western culture? I mean, the Bible <laughs> is, is at the ground of almost every major uh, institution and, and uh, intuition that we have in, in Western culture. Read someone like Hegel, and then Marx is a uh, secularized version of it. But where's the idea come from that history has a purpose? History has yeah. a teleology. History is going somewhere. It's not just cyclical. That's a very common view both in the ancient world and today. And it's interesting that you bring up Marx because as you see these kind of modern, secular uh, substitutes for yeah. what we get in the Bible, you, so this is a substitute religion, substitute purpose for the world, it doesn't have a great track record. I mean, if we're, if we're going to be judging the civilization that the Bible built, perhaps we should compare it to the alternatives. I mean, the minute you turn from God as the ground of both knowing and willing, chaos will ensue. That's a basic biblical intuition, and it's dead right, it seems to me, that when you say, no, I'm, I'm the criterion of truth and goodness, which is, is rampant today. I mean, it was Jean-Paul Sartre in the mid-20th century saying that existence precedes essence. That was the idea. My freedom comes first. Friedrich Nietzsche, the will to power, et cetera. Those things that were in the high European culture, they're now the default position of every teenager in America, <laughs> yes. right? They get their slogans and they're on t-shirts. No, but they are. That's <laughs> the default position of every teenager in America that I set the tone for my whole life. Right. The Bible would call that an expression of the, of the original sin, the original problem. So the book of Genesis, the most complex book probably ever mm -hmm. written. What's the plot in 30 seconds? <laughs> I would say creation of all things. 
followed by the fall, followed by the effects of the fall. So stories, for example, of Cain and Abel, of the Tower of Babel, of Noah's Ark. And then in chapter 12, the beginning of the rescue operation. So God calls Abram. And then Abram is the first of the great patriarchs. And then from him comes Isaac, all the stories around him. And then his son is Jacob, all the stories around him. Jacob has a number of children, but then at the tail end comes Joseph. And then we get all the great stories uh, involving him. If I put it theologically, creation, the fall, the effects of the fall, and then the beginning of this great rescue operation, which is the formation of a holy people after the mind and heart of God. And we begin to see it unfolding from Abraham through Joseph. I did There's not, the plot. I did not think it was possible <laughs> to summarize Genesis in 30 seconds. You got it. You have done it. But there is more to the story. It begins with probably the most famous line ever written, which is, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light. And there was light, and God saw that the light was good. There's a lot more. That's yeah. the beginning. And so much we could say just about those lines. I'll say just this much. Um, God creates through a great act of speech in the Bible. It's a metaphorical expression of the fact that God creates through his mind, through his intelligence, imbuing thereby the entire world with intelligibility. That's why that verse, I would argue, is at the ground of much of Western science. If God makes the world through an act of speech, that means the world is imbued with intelligibility. Therefore, I can go out with my searching mind confidently to meet it. That's an extraordinary claim. God bringing from chaos intelligibility. And that marks all of reality. So if God's the creator of all things, the heavens and the earth, biblical code for everything in the finite realm, all of it is touched by intelligibility. Also notice, in so many of the ancient myths of, of creation, creation happens through some primordial act of violence. There's usually some kind of warfare of, of one set of gods against another. Very often, it's the conquered gods whose bodies make up the world. So it's through an act of violence. The biblical account is one of nonviolence. God makes the world through this nonviolent and generous act of speech. So much today of uh, this revolt against the Western tradition and religion comes down to a phrase that's becoming very popular on college campuses, which is that speech is violence. The yeah. conflation of these two things when really they're op opposed. I mean, speech can become violent when it's conditioned by sin. And so we'll right. watch that in the Bible. I mean, so almost right away, uh, sin begins to characterize the human race. And our speech thereby becomes weaponized. And that happens mm. throughout the Bible. But the primordial speech, the great act by which God makes all things, is an act of nonviolence. How wonderful, too, that from a Christian perspective, that same word becomes incarnate in Jesus Christ. And so the, the nonviolent intelligence of God becomes incarnate in Jesus. God creates the world through this act of speech, and God creates man. And everything is perfect, everything is going tickety-boo, but not for very long, because sin and death enter the world. Yeah. Maybe back up a step, though. Uh, I love tickety-boo, by the way, which is a well-known <laughs> biblical phrase. Uh, back up a little bit, because it's so important the Bible sets humanity within a, a cosmic context. Mm -hmm. So God makes everything, not just human beings, but everything, the heavens and the earth. And we even hear of, we hear of, you know, sun and moon and planets and so on. We also hear of the earth and the water, but even, even the creepy things that crawl upon the earth, even the low level realities are all made by God. That's a very important move in the ancient world. When you have various Gnostic type theories that would say, no, the spiritual is good, the material is bad. Yeah, everything physical is evil right. and should be resisted. And that, boy, talk about a, a view that goes from the ancient world to today in many ways. Yeah. Uh, the Bible is insistent upon the goodness of all dimensions of creation. Now led by human beings, that's our job, is to give right praise to God on behalf of all creation. Now we see what for the Bible is the whole story. That's what we're meant to be. Sin, as we'll see, is a suspension of that. Sin is a violation of right praise. That's the next step in the drama. So everything is ordered, yeah, uh, and it is good, and it's all looking up at God, and, and human beings come last. And as you say, this is such a key point, because today there are these new theories and ideologies which say, you know, my body is somehow evil, and really yeah. it's only my detached 
metaphysical self that's, yes. that's good and you have to change your body. And all these kind of theories yes. that keep cropping up over the years. This was not true in the Garden of Eden at the very beginning of the book of Genesis. So what goes wrong? What goes wrong is bad praise. So we're, we're designed for praise. Worship, our word worship is from an older English word, worthship, right? What's of highest worth? In the biblical vision, when God is of highest worth, then order obtains within the one who worships and order obtains around him or her. It's the key to harmony. God is the highest. So we say in, in the Catholic Mass, glory to God in the highest yeah. and on earth peace to people of goodwill. That's a, that's a kind of formula. Hmm. If I give glory to God in the highest, then peace will tend to break out around me. What is sin? One way to read it is bad praise. When you start giving highest worth to something other than God, something less than God, then you disintegrate and the world tends to disintegrate around you. So I would say on the biblical diagnosis, that's the basic problem. Hmm. They stop abiding by God. So God gives the commands and God calls them to order their lives according to his purpose. They turn from that. They listen to a lower voice. They listen to a deceptive voice. And that leads to the disintegration. Before original sin, the great blessing, all that God makes is good, imbued with intelligibility. I also love how the church fathers emphasize God gives an almost infinite permission. So God says, eat of all the trees in the garden. Except for they, one. Right, but see, we, we jump right to the great <laughs> prohibition, but the church fathers said, no, all, all that stands for human flourishing in its various forms. It stands for science and art and philosophy and friendship and conversation and politics and all the things that make life wonderful and interesting. That's eating of, the, of all the, the trees in the garden. What's the one thing you can't do or shouldn't do? You should not arrogate to yourself the prerogative of discriminating between good and evil. That's mm. to say, God alone is the criterion by which good and evil are, are properly discriminated. Yeah. When I say, oh no, no, that's my choice, that's my determination, that's when it falls apart. But see, there's a very puritanical kind of reading of, of those texts where God creates, but then right away, a prohibition, and God is on top of us, and you better not do that. No, think of the original uh, blessing first. You've the got the whole world. The original <laughs> permission, if you want. Because see, I, I'm a great devotee of St. Irenaeus who said, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. That's the permission in the garden. The prohibition is, but don't you set good and evil on your own terms. Which which we want to do so much today. I mean, you, see this, in, you see this in Supreme Court decisions. There was yep. this very famous one, Planned Parenthood v. Casey, Casey, where Justice Kennedy said, we have the right to define reality for ourselves. Casey, it's breathtaking the way it states it. Something like, it, it belongs to the very nature of liberty to determine the meaning of my life yeah. and of existence. <laughs> oh, that's all. <laughs> that's all I have a right to determine the meaning of existence. Where the biblical vision is, no, no, you're... You're under the aegis of the Creator God who wants you fully alive. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a game of rivalry. But when you live your life now in accord with that desire, you're in the, in the attitude of right praise, then you experience integration and, and the world finds harmony around you. Sin is the suspension of that. And, and the great expression of it is, I am God. See? Yeah. I, I'm going to grasp at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's where the trouble comes from on the symbolic reading of Genesis. Adam and Eve sin. They yeah. get cast out of the Garden of Eden. And you see sin and death pervade the world very, very quickly. I'm struck by the story of Cain and Abel. The, mm -hmm. the sons of Adam and Eve, they are born to the first parents. And the one brother kills the other brother. The beginning of civilization is an act of fratricide. And who saw that very early on was St. Augustine. Namely, that in the Bible, uh, the founder of cities, Cain, is a murderer. Mm -hmm. And Augustine <laughs> commented that it's very interestingly similar to another founding of a city, namely Rome, <laughs> founded by Romulus, who killed his brother Remus. Right. So what is it about cities and fratricide? And brothers, yeah. <laughs> yeah, is there something deeply dysfunctional at the heart of even our greatest civilizational expressions? Mm. So like a city... Civis, right? Civilization comes from the idea of a city. The Bible likes cities. The Bible celebrates cities in many ways. At the same time, the Bible knows, as, as Augustine saw, there's something dysfunctional there. Hmm. Because of sin, we tend to organize ourselves often through 
violence and scapegoating and us against them and one against the other, rather than, think now the end of the Bible, when the holy city of Jerusalem descends, what you have there is the properly ordered city. A whole city, remember there's no temple in it. Why? You don't need a temple if everyone's right. ordered to God. Right. See, we need temples because we need to be reminded, oh yeah, my my private life, my political life, my entertainment life should all be ordered to God. I need a temple or a church to remind me. In the in the heavenly Jerusalem, I don't need that because everything's already in right praise. If it's not, I've got an earthly city, hmm. you know? And it's always predicated to some degree upon this dysfunction. Makes me want to flee to the country. It should make you want to remake the great cities, you know, according to the to the spirit and mind of God. One part we haven't even touched on, but it's one of the most famous moments in Genesis, is the flood. When God decides these people are so awful that I'm going to drown them all in a flood, except for the one guy who found favor with the Lord, yeah, Noah, right. who builds this ark. Must Everyone must have thought he was a complete crazy person, building this giant ark, and then the floods come, and... He is saved, and he's got two of each kind of all the animals, and the waters go away, and he gets out, and he immediately kills an animal and sacrifices (laughs) it to the Lord, and the Lord says, I will not destroy humanity anymore in a flood because the imagination of man's heart is evil from the beginning, and I see that. What am I supposed to make of that? Well, it's a wonderful story and a complex story. I'd say a couple things about it. In the Hebrew, that lovely little phrase, the tohu vabohu, is the primal watery chaos out of which God brings order. So the tohu vabohu stands for all that is opposed to God's creative intentions. So what happens now with the flood, the return of the watery chaos? It's a kind of law of karma, if you want, that the Bible does have. Namely, there are effects of sin. There are effects of bad praise. If you turn from God to creatures, you will disintegrate and the world will tend to disintegrate around you. So the floodwaters represent that, the thoroughness, I might say, of the dysfunction of the human family. I would say in the Bible, never read the punishments of God as somehow capricious, arbitrary uh, outbursts. He woke up on the wrong side of the yeah, bed. Yeah, no, no. See, that they're using emotional language uh, to express the, the, um, God's impatience with human dysfunction. So the anger of God is not God falling into a snit. It's God's great justice as it stands athwart the injustice of the world. So think of the, of the of, of floodwaters as the return of the tohu vabohu. But what's God always interested in? Rescue operations. So Abram and Israel is a rescue operation. The, the ark is a sort of a primordial rescue operation. So God preserves a remnant of his good creation on this ship. This is why the church fathers beautifully saw Noah as an anticipation of Jesus. His name means peace. The ark as an anticipation of uh, the church. So on the ark of the church, we find safety and we find a sort of remnant of God's good creation preserved. The whole biblical narrative, you want to go from creation out of the very end, I'll speak as a Christian, the book of Revelation, is the descent of the heavenly Jerusalem. It's the rightly ordered creation, but expressed as a city, all engaged in right praise. That's how the whole Bible ends. Because I am eager for how we all get to that ending, we have to get into the rescue operation. Think of sin now as producing a dysfunctional family. So, Uh, as alcohol abuse can produce dysfunction in an entire family. Mm -hmm. Um, Sexual abuse can produce dysfunction everywhere. Well, sin now has come into the human family. That's the insight of of the book of Genesis. And it's produced dysfunction at all levels. The mind has fallen. The will is compromised. Where must the solution come from? It can't come from within the dysfunctional family. Just as if someone who's in a dysfunctional situation, that's all they know. That's the air they've always breathed. Yeah. Only when something comes radically from outside that dysfunction can they be um, liberated. Well, in a similar way, again, I'm speaking as a Christian, someone has to come from outside that system, but yet participating within the dysfunction of the system, inside <laughs> of its dynamics. Right. And so we say that Jesus is truly divine and truly human. And it's that coming together of the two that leads to the solution. Now, that's we're cutting to the end of the story. Yeah. <laughs> but you see where the, where the narrative, though, it's very interesting how the narrative right. unfolds. 
the goodness of creation, the compromise of sin. But then much of Genesis is how God begins to form a rescue operation. Hmm. And it's the formation of this holy people, Israel, beginning with Abraham. But then culminating, I would say as a Christian, in Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, the new David, also the new Abraham, who fulfills God's great um, rescue operation. God forms a people, beginning with Abram, he's first called, who hears the voice of the Lord and follows him. When he says, Abram, get up, leave your homeland, leave your people, and go in search of a promised land. You're like, what? I mean, what your, what your ego would want. You're 75 years old. Yeah. Uh, That's right. He's, you, he's, he's no spring chicken at right. this point. Right. And you want me to get up and leave everyone, everyone I know, and, and go in search of a, of a land that you'll show me? See, that's the fulcrum in so many ways upon which the whole narrative turns. Because Abram, unlike Adam and Eve, is willing to listen. And keep in mind the, the great prayer of Israel, you know, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is God alone. Listen. Listen. So Abraham is someone who listens to a higher voice, a voice beyond his own ego. Mm -hmm. So he goes now on a spiritual adventure. And that commences the process by which God forms a whole people who will listen to him. Now, go down from Abraham to his son Isaac, and that still, I mean, chilling story of the, um, of the attempted sacrifice of Isaac. But what was that but Abram listening to God? I mean, despite all possible opposition, despite every hesitation, listening to God. Abraham gets, he has no children through his life. His wife is barren. He, he's ancient now. He's ancient. He's very, yeah. very old. And he has a son, Isaac, and God says, okay, now go kill your son. No, I want him, I want him back. I want him and, back. And uh, as Kierkegaard and so many others have seen, how awful that is. If you don't feel how awful that story is, you haven't understood it properly. But it's his willingness to... Listen to that voice above all other voices, mm -hmm. and that's what makes him. Uh, that's what makes him the father of faith. We say, and the founder of this holy family, this holy people, Israel. Now it goes from Abram to Isaac, then to Jacob or Israel, as he's named, after having wrestled with God. And of course, that's what Israel means. And I, I love that. What makes this people holy is that they they wrestle with God. And why, ja Jacob literally wrestles. Yeah, that beautiful with God. scene. Yeah. In a perfect world, if we had never sinned, we wouldn't have to wrestle with God. We would walk as Adam did before the fall in easy fellowship with God. Mm -hmm. That beautiful little image of, you know, in the cool of the evening, Adam walking uh, with God. But see, after the fall, we're off kilter. We're, we're off the beam, and so so we have to we have to wrestle with God. We wrestle with God's will. So Genesis begins with the creation narrative, and it ends with Joseph, son of Israel. He's got all these brothers who sell him into slavery. They want to kill him, but then they just sell him into slavery. He goes down to Egypt. He gets thrown into prison in Egypt. He's treated very terribly, and then he rises to prominence, and he becomes. I don't know what you'd call him, at least a governor or some very serious person con controlling so much of the politics of Egypt. And he saves the Egyptians and everyone in the nearby regions from famine through his ingenuity, through his uh, interpreting these messages and dreams. And his brothers who tried to kill him come down asking for help. They, spoiler alert, apologize. He forgives them because God has used Joseph to save everybody. They would have all died from starvation if God had not taken this sin of the brothers trying to kill and then sell Joseph down the river, turned that into good for everybody. At his best, he's somebody who listens and abides and accepts the providence of God even when everything seems to be running counter to that providence. Right. So that's the, the whole story of you know, his brothers who hated him, they were jealous of him. Understandably, you know, he has the dream where, oh, you know, by the way, I'm standing, and you guys are all bowing down to me. Yes, I mean, of course they hated him. A, in a, a way. word in in uh, defense of Joseph's brothers yeah. is he's a little bit of a show off. He's a little difficult. He's a little difficult. Right. He says, I had this dream where I don't really know what it means, but it sounds like I'm going to rule all of you, and you're all going to bow down to me. And of course, the the in the beautifully crafted uh, story, they do indeed by the end <laughs> bow do. down yeah. to him, asking you know for for bread. But see, by that time. Joseph had been chastened. By that time, he had been through the crucible. And that's very typical. Talk about wrestling with God. Yeah. All the great heroes of Israel, think of Moses, yeah. they, think of David. They, they all wrestle with the Lord. And that's why Joseph, at that propitious moment, is able to respond with magnanimity. 
if his brothers had bowed down to him when he was 12 years old and wearing the multicolored coat, I mean, talk about the most obnoxious kid in Israel. But after the chastening, now he was ready to respond in a godlike way, which is to say, with forgiveness and generosity. And so it's Joseph now embodying the best of Israel, but after having wrestled quite a bit with God. See, and that's to your earlier point mm -hmm. of all these characters are, are compromised and flawed. They're all part of a dysfunctional family. But God has planted within this holy people, Israel, something of his own character, mm -hmm. right? They're people after his own heart, as God says of, of David. Um, that's the beauty of that story, I think. And you're right, that's the culmination of the book of Genesis. The church is God's rescue operation, or if you want, it's Israel. Mm -hmm. Stay within the confines of, of the law and of the dictate of God's will, and you're going to find peace and harmony even in the midst of the tohu vabohu, in the midst of a, of a, of a dysfunctional world. So ultimately, the, the news there is, is very good news, as it always is in the Bible. It's meant to say God is interested in rescuing us. There is also this cause for caution, because all of our common ancestor, Adam, chooses through his free will to sin, Sin pervades the world, and yet there's a rescue operation Yeah, and you know, well. stay with that, because I think what would help us today is the language of addiction, which we're very much at home with. You never say, oh, I'm a former <laughs> alcoholic. Right. No, I'm a recovering <laughs> alcoholic, because crouching at the door of my heart and mind is always the threat of this uh, addiction. Sin is like that. Sin is like that. And so even as I say, you know, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me— Nevertheless, I realize that sin, we call it a concupiscence in the Catholic tradition, is always there at, at the gate, which is why I'm permanently in need of a Savior. Whenever you say, I can perfect myself, right. that's, that's opening the door to disaster because you have to say, no, no, I can't save myself. Well, it, it reminds me when, when we think about the sort of inciting incident of Genesis, the fall of man and sin entering the world. I, which is only after the first inciting incident, which is the creation of everything. Right. When we think about that, it reminds me of what we say on Easter, which is, oh, happy fault. Yeah. The, this, this choice of Adam, this fault, this guilt, this sin. Oh, happy fault that won for us so great, so glorious a redeemer, that there's a happy ending, which is actually better than if we'd all stayed in the garden in the first place. Right. The premise of this show is that our educational institutions are bunk, curricula are falling apart. People don't even have the cultural literacy to read the Bible when they're children anymore. All of that yeah. is gone. That's a pretty sad state of affairs. And yet, it's very often people who have fallen into degradation who are most happy of their need to be brought yeah. out of it and uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. And I think we're seeing just a little bit of that. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have another... Uh, 300 hours to even begin to probe the depths of Genesis. But thank you so much. What a wonderful introduction to an introduction to a very brief introduction of Genesis. And we'll have to have My you pleasure. come back and do all the other books of the Bible. I'd love it. Thank you. That is Bishop Robert Barron. I'm Michael Knowles. That is the book of Genesis, or at least a very small part of it. And this is the book club. We'll see you next month. Happy reading. Thank you so much for watching this episode of The Book Club on PragerU. PragerU is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, so we rely on donations from viewers like you to keep this content on the air. Please consider making a tax-deductible contribution today to help keep this content coming. Thank you very much.